I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello listeners, this is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, onto the episode. Hi, Corey. Hi, Elise. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm excited because we are moving on to our next play in the Shakespeare Anyone series. Can you believe that? No. No. I'm excited that it's here, though. Mm -hmm. We are going to be talking about Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. We are stepping Should away. Like drum roll, please. Yes, yeah, drum roll, please. Twelfth Night. We are stepping away from the murder and the mayhem of Macbeth and other tragedies and decided, let's have a palate cleanser, right? You know what? Tragedies can be a bit of a bummer. Mm -hmm. So let's not do another bummer back to back with that old murder and treason play, Macbeth. Mm -hmm. Let's do something fun and... Uh, Lighthearted. And uh, Twelfth Night is one of your favorite plays. I do correct? really. Yeah, I do. We were going back and forth between Twelfth Night and As You Like It. And at the end of the day, I will admit, 
Part of why I really wanted to do Twelfth Night is because as a teenager, She's the Man was one of my favorite movies, one of my favorite comedies. Yes! <laughs> and it is the inspiration, the basis for that movie. And Twelfth Night also just has so much fun, mistaken identity, love, uh, the uncertainty of gender. There's just a lot of fun. A whole plot point based around a prank yes. on someone. Yes. Like, like what? what is that Shakespeare? It's- Good time. Yes. Like Macbeth, we are going to start with a synopsis, and then we'll have an episode of stuff to chew on, Mm -hmm. major themes, things that people usually talk about. Right. And then we'll do a series, a few episodes, focusing on going a little bit deeper into Mm -hmm. some of those aspects of this play. Yeah. Shall we? Let's. This play starts with Orsino, the Duke of Illyria, yearning to one of his gentlemen, Curio, as well as other lords, for an excess of love. The first line in this play is from that famous If music be the food of love, play on speech. Curio then asks Orsino if he will go hunt the heart. H-A-R-T as in stag. Orsino misinterprets the meaning for H-E-A-R-T and brings up his desire for Olivia, a countess who doesn't seem interested in his pursuits. Another gentleman, Valentine, enters with bad news. He was unable to deliver a message to Olivia, presumably from Orsino. But Olivia's lady's maid did tell Valentine this. Olivia is currently in deep mourning due to the death of her brother. While Orsino admires Olivia for the love she shows her dead brother, he wishes her sorrow wouldn't kill all her other feelings of love she might have, specifically for him. He then announces he will leave to go hang out in a shady place to contemplate love. We then head to an unspecified location to meet Viola, a captain, and some non-speaking sailors. Now, I do want to point out that in some productions, starting around the 18th century and up to now, this scene and the previous are sometimes inverted. This swap has been credited to companies choosing the potency of beginning a play with a storm rather than a discussion and a man whining about love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But the Arden Third Edition places Viola's first appearance as Act 1, Scene 2. So that's what we're going with. Viola asks the captain where they are, and the captain tells her that they are in Illyria. They have a conversation that provides exposition explaining how they got to Illyria in the first place. We learn that they were shipwrecked from a storm. The storm separated Viola from her twin brother Sebastian, who she fears has drowned. The captain assures her that he might be alive, seeing as he watched Sebastian ride the waves on a mast that remained afloat. Viola then asks the captain if he knows this country, and he replies, Yes, he grew up three hours away. The country is ruled by a noble duke named Orsino. The captain shares the hot gossip that Orsino is a bachelor who seeks the love of Olivia, who is the daughter of a count who died a year ago. Her brother then died shortly after. Due to this, she refuses the sight of men. Viola then expresses an interest in serving Olivia as a way to disguise her identity and social status for the time being. The captain responds that it won't be possible because Olivia won't even admit the duke. Viola then asks the captain to help her with a scheme, to disguise her identity so she can serve the duke. She tells the captain he can present Viola as a eunuch. The captain agrees, and they exit. We then head to a third location, Olivia's household. There, we meet Sir Toby, a relative of Olivia's, and her lady's maid, Mariah. Sir Toby complains that Olivia's sadness over her brother's death is restricting his own revelries, to which Mariah lectures Sir Toby on his late-night drinking escapades. She brings up Sir Toby's guest, Sir Andrew Aguecheek, a knight he invited over late one night to woo Olivia. Sir Toby responds that Sir Andrew is a valiant and wealthy man who plays the Viola de Gamba and can speak every language by heart. Mariah counters that Sir Andrew is a fool and a cowardly braggart. Plus, he's Sir Toby's drinking buddy. Sir Andrew enters right on cue. Sir Toby introduces Sir Andrew to Mariah. Sir Toby convinces Sir Andrew he should accost or talk to Mariah. Sir Andrew misinterprets Sir Toby's meaning of accost as have sex with, and so begins a conversation which includes lots of wordplay, where Mariah implies Sir Andrew is a fool and jokes about his sex drive, which he completely misses. Mariah then exits, and Sir Andrew confides in Sir Toby that he doesn't think of himself as smart. 
Sir Toby agrees. Sir Andrew then expresses regret for not learning the arts the way he learned to fence, dance, and bear bait. Sir Andrew then goes on to say he will head home tomorrow because Olivia isn't interested in him. Sir Toby assures him there's still hope for him and Olivia. Now hopeful, Sir Andrew decides to stay another month and expresses interest in finding a party so he can go dancing. Sir Andrew brags to Sir Toby about his dancing skills, to which Sir Toby pokes fun at him by emphatically praising his abilities. And yes, Sir Andrew comically shows off his dancing in this scene. Sir Andrew, emboldened by dance, suggests the two go to a revel. Sir Toby agrees. They exit. Now we head back to Duke Orsino's household to find Valentine and a cross-dressing Viola, being referred to as Cesario, in conversation. And I want to point out that, moving forward, we will refer to Viola as Viola and use she-her pronouns when she is presenting as feminine or when all characters on stage know she is a woman, and use he-him pronouns when the character presents as male. So, here we go. Valentine tells Cesario that Orsino thinks quite favorably of him, even though he's only been in the Duke's service for three days. Then, Orsino enters with Curio and his attendants. Orsino tells Cesario that he has a mission for him. Go to Olivia and deliver a message. The passion of his love. And do not return empty-handed. Orsino thinks Olivia will accept the message more favorably if the youthful Cesario delivers it, instead of one of his graver messengers. Cesario does not think Olivia will admit him. To this, Orsino assures him that they will admit him and breaks down why. He is young and looks quite feminine. This passage plays on the theatrical construct of Shakespeare's time, when a boy actor played the part of girl Viola disguised as boy Cesario. Cesario accepts Orsino's mission. He will try to woo Olivia. Then... Viola turns to the audience to admit she is wrapped up in an internal struggle. She has to woo a wife for Orsino, while she herself would like to be Orsino's wife. We are back at Olivia's house with Mariah and Festi, Olivia's court jester, in conversation about how Festi is in hot water with Olivia because of his unknown absence from the house. Mariah prods him to tell her where he's been, but he refuses, even if it causes him to lose his job. Olivia... Malvolio, her steward, and her attendants enter. Mariah advises Festi to tell Olivia of his whereabouts, and she exits. Festi then pumps himself up to entertain Olivia, advising himself, better a witty fool than a foolish wit. Festi greets an upset Olivia, who demands the guards take the fool away, to which Festi jests that the guards should take the lady away. He's calling Olivia the fool instead. Olivia tells Festi he is a dry, or dull fool, and he's unreliable due to his truancy. Festi jokes that in order to fix this problem, she should give the dry fool a drink and says she should let him fix himself. She won't budge. Festi begs Olivia to understand he is only a fool in profession, not by nature, and he can prove it. In order to prove it, Festi must first interrogate Olivia. She has nothing better to do, so sure, she'll endure it. Festi asks her why she is in mourning. She says it's because of her brother's death. Festi points out that she shouldn't mourn for her brother's soul if he's in heaven, not hell, and again demands the guards take the fool, Olivia, away. Olivia asks Malvolio if he thinks Festi's jests have improved. Malvolio replies that yes, and his foolishness will continue to improve as he develops an illness that will reduce his cleverness and make him even more foolish. Festi turns it back on Malvolio by hoping God sends him an illness to improve his own folly. Festi points out that, while he himself is a fool by profession, Malvolio is a fool by nature. Malvolio cannot believe Olivia takes joy in such a dull fool. Mariah enters and announces there's a young man who wants to speak with her. He and his attendants are waiting with the drunk Sir Toby. Olivia orders Mariah to get Sir Toby away from the group. She also orders Malvolio that, if the gentleman is from Orsino, he make an excuse like she is sick or not at home. Olivia and Festi are left alone on stage and start to engage in a conversation when Sir Toby enters, super drunk. Olivia asks who the gentleman is, but Sir Toby is too drunk to give a clear answer. He burps and blames it on a pickled herring and then completely mishears Olivia and exits without answering Olivia's question. Olivia sends Festi off to babysit Sir Toby. 
Malvolio returns and tells Olivia the visitor insists he will speak with her. Even though Malvolio said Olivia is sick and that she is asleep, neither excuse worked. The visitor insists he will stay and wait until he speaks with her. Olivia then asks Malvolio to describe the visitor. Malvolio compares the visitor to Narcissus, an androgynous, young, and beautiful creature somewhere between a boy and a man. Olivia decides to let the visitor in, so Malvolio calls on Mariah. Mariah covers Olivia's face with her veil for mourning and prepares herself to once more hear of Orsino's mission. Viola enters as Cesario. Remember, when Viola is playing the part of Cesario, we will refer to her as Cesario and use he, him pronouns. This part of the scene has an overflow of theatrical jargon as Viola plays the role assigned to her by Orsino. Cesario asks if Olivia, in her veil, is the lady of the house. Olivia does not reveal her identity and responds that Cesario can deliver the message to her and she will speak for the lady. Cesario does not want to waste his excellently memorized speech on anyone but the lady. Olivia asks where Cesario came from, but Cesario refuses to say any more than his speech. Olivia finally reveals that she is the lady of the house and tells Cesario that they only let him in to wonder at him, so if he is mad, please leave. But if he has something to say, be quick. Cesario says he will speak only to Olivia. What he has to say is only for her ears. Olivia gives in and dismisses Mariah and her attendants. Cesario finally begins his memorized speech, but Olivia interrupts him to ask where this text comes from. Cesario responds, from Orsino's heart. Olivia dismisses this response. She asks if Cesario has anything else to say. Cesario goes off script and asks to see Olivia's face. Olivia lifts her veil to reveal her beautiful face. Cesario compliments her looks and tells her it's a shame she will not pass down her good looks to any children. Olivia begins to catalog her own looks. Item, two lips. Item, two gray eyes. Item, one neck. And accuses Cesario of evaluating her. Cesario calls Olivia out for being proud, especially when his master loves her. Olivia asks how Orsino loves her. Cesario responds that Orsino loves Olivia passionately. Olivia tells Cesario that Orsino already knows her thoughts. She compliments the Duke, but says ultimately she cannot love him. Cesario then goes super off script and tells Olivia if he loved Olivia with the same passion as Orsino, he too would not be able to understand it. Olivia asks why, and Cesario delivers a speech about all the pitiful sorrow he would feel if she didn't reciprocate his love. Olivia then changes the subject and asks Cesario about his parents. Cesario responds that he is better born than his current circumstances suggest. Olivia then sends Cesario back to Orsino to tell him that she cannot love him and to stop sending messengers. Although, she wouldn't mind if Cesario came back to tell her how Orsino took the message. Cesario scolds Olivia for her coldness towards his master and then exits. Olivia then swoons over Cesario. She quickly stops herself and tells herself to slow down. She questions how quickly someone can fall in love and thinks love might have crept up on her just because of Cesario's looks. Olivia then calls on Malvolio to deliver a message to Cesario. He should come back tomorrow. She also gives Malvolio a ring to give back to Cesario. But Cesario didn't bring a ring with him. Malvolio exits and leaves Olivia on stage to tell the audience that she is afraid she is relying more on what she sees than what she thinks. But she wants fate to show her what's to be. Now it's time to meet two new characters, Sebastian and Antonio. They are in an unspecified location in Illyria, much like the first scene with Viola. Sebastian, we quickly learn, is Viola's twin brother, who she thinks drowned. He thinks Viola drowned. We learn Antonio is a pirate who rescued Sebastian from drowning. This scene very much mirrors Viola's scene with the sea captain in order to underscore the bond between the separated twins, except it has the added bonus of friendship, or romance, between the two characters. Sebastian heads to Orsino's court. Antonio is left on stage, weighing whether or not he should follow Sebastian. Apparently, he has some mysterious enemies in Orsino's court. However, his adoration for Sebastian leads Antonio to follow him. Then we head to another unspecified location. However, it is probably close by to Olivia's house as this scene is the follow-up to Olivia's instructions to Malvolio. Malvolio enters going one direction while Cesario enters from another, suggesting that Malvolio has been searching for Cesario and has finally caught up with him. 
Malvolio tells Cesario that Olivia is returning the ring Cesario gave her. Cesario says that he gave no ring to Olivia, so Malvolio throws it at Cesario's feet. Left alone on stage, Viola drops the pretense of Cesario as she picks up the ring and realizes that Olivia has affections for Cesario. Viola curses her disguise in the only instance in Shakespeare where a cross-dressing heroine questions the morality of her disguise and is at a loss about what she will do. She leaves it up to time as the situation is too complicated for her to figure out. Now we are back in Olivia's household with Sir Toby and Sir Andrew. This scene was traditionally set in the kitchen, so feel free to imagine that. Sir Toby and Sir Andrew have been drinking, and Sir Toby is quoting some traditional proverbs that were taught in English grammar schools, and Sir Andrew doesn't get it, which suggests his lack of education. Festy enters, and Sir Andrew and Sir Toby implore him for a song or a round of joke-telling. Festy jokes a little and sings a love song. Then there's more joking and the start of another song when Mariah enters, scolding the trio for their loudness. She says she is surprised Malvolio hasn't shown up already to kick them out of the house for being so raucous. Sir Toby begins to sing as Malvolio shows up, complaining about the noise at this time of night and saying that it is disrupting the household. He's a Karen. Sir Toby tells Malvolio to sneck up, which is basically the same as F off. Then Sir Toby and Festy continue to sing and ultimately get Malvolio to sneck up. Sir Toby and Sir Andrew consider challenging Malvolio to a duel, but Mariah pipes up that she could easily trick Malvolio and make him look like an idiot. Mariah shares with the two knights that Malvolio is supposedly some kind of Puritan, but she casts doubts on the sincerity of his piety. She suggests Malvolio is just an opportunist and is pretending to be a Puritan because it serves his interests. She wants to trick him into showing that he is just as full of vice as everyone he looks down on. So, she plans to write several love letters that appear to be written by Olivia about Malvolio and drop them where Malvolio will be sure to pick them up. She tells Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Festy that she will tell them where she plans to drop the letter so that they can observe Malvolio finding it. Mariah exits, and Sir Toby and Sir Andrew leave to continue drinking as it is now too late to go to bed. Next, we are back at Orsino's. Orsino asks for a piece of music that he delighted in last night to be played again, but Curio informs him that Festy, who sang it, isn't in the room, but is somewhere around the house. Curio is sent to go find Festy. Orsino engages Cesario in a discussion about love, asking Cesario if there are any ladies he likes. Cesario describes a woman very much like Orsino, who does not catch on to this veiled confession of love. Curio returns with Festy, who sings and jokes and then is paid and leaves. Orsino tells everyone else to leave, but calls Cesario back to stay. He tells Cesario to return to Olivia and continue to implore her on Orsino's behalf. Cesario counters that what if Olivia cannot love Orsino? Orsino says he won't take no for an answer. Cesario tries to use reason. What if a woman loved Orsino as much as he loves Olivia, but he didn't like her? Wouldn't he want her to take no for an answer? Orsino says that women can't love as hard as men can, so that could never happen. Cesario tells Orsino that he knows women can indeed love as hard as men can. He says he had a sister who pined herself to death over a man, as he is all the daughters and sons of his father's house. Remember, Cesario doesn't know that his brother is actually alive, and Cesario is actually the sister who is actively pining over Orsino. Cesario leaves to go woo Olivia for Orsino, and Orsino gives him a piece of jewelry to give Olivia. Back at Olivia's, Sir Toby and Sir Andrew are talking with Fabian, who is either another servant in Olivia's household or an Italian visitor. They have brought Fabian along to see Mariah's trick for Malvolio, as Fabian is also not a fan of Malvolio. Apparently, Malvolio got Fabian in trouble with Olivia because Fabian went to see some bear baiting. Mariah enters with a letter, she tells the men to hide, as Malvolio is just behind her on the walk, and she drops the letter before exiting. Malvolio enters, talking to himself about how Mariah once told him that Olivia was attracted to him. He begins to imagine what life would be like if he married Olivia, while Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian watch and provide colorful commentary from a distance. Malvolio spies the letter and picks it up. He believes the handwriting is Olivia's and it makes one of the dirtiest double innuendos in the canon. 
He references her C's, her U's, and T's. The word cut was slang for female genitalia, and similar in usage to modern slang that adds an N in the middle of the word cut, and thus makes she her great P's. Sir Andrew does not get the joke. In the contents of the letter, Malvolio finds a poem that he reasons is a love poem for him, as well as instructions that should the subject of the poem find the letter and wish to change his state, he should begin to act eccentrically and wear yellow stockings with cross garters. He resolves to be all that the letter asks him to be, which includes smiling always in Olivia's presence, and leaves. Fabian, Sir Toby, and Sir Andrew begin to praise Mariah's trick as she re-enters. She explains that Olivia hates yellow and cross garters and is so melancholy that if Malvolio is constantly smiling around her, she will grow to despise him. The foursome exits, looking forward to seeing Malvolio make a fool of himself. We head back to Olivia's garden where Viola and Festi engage in verbal fooling about Festi's profession and his living situation. They then question the reliability of language as a representation of truth, which was a much debated topic during Shakespeare's time. We then learn Festi does not care for Cesario. There may be a degree of hostility between Cesario and the clown over Cesario's new role as go-between between between Orsino and Olivia, which is Festi's role. Cesario pays Festi for his jests and Festi exits. Sir Toby and Sir Andrew enter and Sir Andrew greets Cesario in French. Cesario responds back in French, a possible nod to Viola's genteel upbringing. Sir Toby asks if Cesario is here to see his niece. Cesario says yes, and Sir Toby invites Cesario to enter. Just then, Olivia and Mariah enter. Cesario asks to speak with Olivia. Olivia dismisses everyone. Alone on stage, Olivia asks Cesario for his name. Cesario gives his name and refers to himself as her servant. Olivia counters that he is Orsino's servant. Cesario responds that because he is Orsino's servant, he is also Olivia's. Olivia does not want to talk of Orsino anymore. Then, Olivia admits that she roped a bunch of people into the ring scheme as a tool to pursue Cesario. She asks Cesario what he thinks of it, and then compares her honor to a bear tied to a pole in a bear baiting event. Cesario admits he pities her. Olivia pities herself and asks Cesario to leave, to which Cesario agrees and asks if she wants to send a message to his master. Olivia then changes her mind and asks Cesario to stay and tell her what he thinks of her. Cesario tells her that he thinks she is not what she actually is. And Cesario also admits that he is not what she thinks he is. Olivia says in an aside to the audience that Cesario's rejection of her has intensified her passion for him. She then turns back to Cesario and blurts out an admission of love. Cesario rebuts that no woman has, nor never shall any woman, aside from himself, have his heart. Cesario dismisses himself and says he will never again return to speak of Orsino's love for her. Olivia invites him back to convince her to like Orsino. We now head to another room in Olivia's house and join Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian. Sir Andrew exclaims that he will not stay any longer. The reason is that he saw Olivia showing goodwill, possibly an interest, in Cesario in the garden. Fabian flips the situation on its head and says it's proof of her love for him. He argues this interest in Cesario is only to light a fire in Sir Andrew. Now the only thing to do? Challenge Cesario to a fight. Sir Toby agrees that he must go write a stern and curt letter to challenge him. Sir Andrew is convinced and exits, presumably to write the letter. Fabian asks if Sir Toby will deliver the letter, and Sir Toby agrees. Mariah then enters to tell Sir Toby and Fabian of the duped Malvolio. He has become quite the renegade and is donning yellow stockings that are, of course, cross-guarded as well. Malvolio seems to obey every part of the letter, including smiling constantly. It's such a sight to see that Mariah can't help but want to throw things at him. Sir Toby implores her to take him to Malvolio. We then head to another unspecified location, traditionally set on a street, for a continuation of Sebastian and Antonio's earlier scene. Because Antonio is willing to go to the trouble of accompanying Sebastian, Sebastian has decided he will no longer reprimand him for his help. Antonio says his willing love for Sebastian is what made him follow him to Illyria. Now that they're here, Sebastian wants to sightsee. 
Antonio thinks it's best to go back to their lodgings first because it is dangerous for him to walk openly in the streets. Apparently, Antonio had a run-in with Orsino's navy. During this time, he and some members of his community stole Orsino's property. Everyone but Antonio agreed to return the stolen items. Now, if he is found in the open, he will pay with his life. Antonio instead decides to let Sebastian borrow some money for his sightseeing. When he is done, he will meet Antonio at the inn. We head back to Olivia's garden with Olivia and Mariah. Olivia has an aside to the audience where we learn she's sent for Cesario. She wonders how she'll impress him, for youths are more easily wooed with a gift than by being begged. Olivia then asks Mariah where Malvolio is. Mariah says that Malvolio is on his way, but he's in a strange and possessed mood. Not mad, but smiling. A lot. Mariah leaves to fetch Malvolio. When Mariah returns with Malvolio, he enters smiling and also wearing the yellow stockings and the cross gartering. Olivia is offended because she asked him here on a serious matter. She asks Malvolio what's wrong. He says he is doing what he was asked. Olivia demands he go to bed, meaning to recover from his madness. Malvolio misinterprets this as a sexual advance that they go to bed, together. Malvolio then recites the letter by heart. Olivia is clearly confused because she's never heard these words before. At one point, she thinks he is referring to her as mad and a servant. In the midst of all of this, a servant enters to say, Cesario has arrived. Olivia asks that Sir Toby be called to look after Malvolio, and she will go meet Cesario. Malvolio is left on stage to brag that everything in the letter is happening as expected. He has no doubts about the success of his situation. Just then, Sir Toby, Fabian, and Mariah enter. Malvolio demands that Fabian leave him be. Mariah informs Malvolio that Sir Toby is sent to take care of him. Malvolio gets snippy with Mariah, and so Sir Toby takes over. He, Mariah, and Fabian begin talking about Malvolio as if he were possessed by the devil. They conclude Malvolio requires treatment for his madness. Malvolio insults all of them and runs away. The remaining three plot to act upon Olivia's current belief that Malvolio is mad and lock him away in a dark room, a common practice for madness in Shakespeare's time, at least until they get tired of their joke. Then they will bring him to the bar to put him on trial for his madness. Just then, Sir Andrew enters with a letter challenging Cesario to a duel for Olivia's love. Sir Toby reads the letter aloud while Fabian and Mariah interject with backhanded compliments that poke fun at Sir Andrew's intelligence and character. In this letter, Sir Andrew follows Sir Toby's bad advice and everyone condescendingly applauds Sir Andrew's work. Of course, Sir Andrew is the butt of the joke, and of course, he doesn't get it. Sir Toby sends Sir Andrew offstage to keep watch for Cesario so that Sir Toby can deliver his message. Last minute, Sir Toby changes his mind about delivering this boring letter. Instead, he is going to present the challenge to Cesario in person so that he can paint Sir Andrew as a real threat and up the chances of a duel. Sir Toby, Mariah, and Fabian see Olivia and Cesario enter together, so they exit. Olivia pities herself for laying her honor out in the open so rashly to someone who is not receptive to her love. Cesario replies that Orsino is still pained with unrequited love, Olivia ignores this and asks Cesario to wear a miniature portrait of her, ask him to return tomorrow, and then asks him what he would ask of her. Cesario says to love Orsino. Olivia asks how she could even love Orsino after everything with Cesario. Cesario says he will acquit her of that. Olivia still asks Cesario to come back tomorrow. She exits. Sir Toby and Fabian enter upon Olivia's exit. Sir Toby warns Cesario to take up whatever defense is best for him because there is someone who Cesario has wronged that waits for him outside the garden. Cesario assures Sir Toby he must be mistaken. He has wronged no man. Sir Toby says, that's not so. And if he values his life, be on guard, for his opponent has youth, strength, skill, and wrath. Cesario confesses he is not a fighter and dismisses the challenge because his rival sounds like someone who just fights people to test his own strength. Sir Toby says, no, the man has beef, and if Cesario won't accept the challenge, Sir Toby will also challenge him in order to get him to accept the challenge. Cesario first wants to know what he did to offend this man because he didn't know he did anything. Sir Toby agrees to go ask. He exits, leaving Cesario with Signor Fabian. Cesario asks Signor Fabian if he knows what type of man this is. Signor Fabian says that while he doesn't look dangerous... 
This man is a fatal opponent. Meanwhile, Sir Toby tells Sir Andrew all about his challenger, Cesario. Sir Toby builds up Cesario to be this devilish figure who is quite likely to kill him in a duel. Sir Andrew decides that he doesn't want a duel anymore. So Sir Toby goes to relay the message. But in an aside to the audience, he says he has another scheme to milk Sir Andrew for his money. Before Sir Toby relays the message, he and Fabian get together and exchange that both Sir Andrew and Cesario are afraid of each other. Finally, Cesario and Sir Andrew are told that their opponent needs to keep their oath due to the laws of being a gentleman, but one will not hurt the other. Fun fact, in Shakespeare's time, it is the law of a duel that the challenged must fight. So, the duel begins. As the duel begins, Antonio, the pirate who saves Sebastian from drowning, enters. Seeing that Cesario, who Antonio believes to be Sebastian, is being threatened by Sir Andrew, Antonio demands Sir Andrew put away his sword. If Sir Andrew's opponent made any offense, Antonio declares he will fight Sir Andrew in his opponent's place. At the same time, some officers enter to break up the duel. One of the officers recognizes Antonio from his days in Illyria. Again, mistaking Cesario for Sebastian, Antonio asks Cesario for some of his money, presumably to pay some legal fees, but Cesario doesn't know what he's talking about. Cesario says that, due to his kindness, he can give Antonio some money, although he doesn't have much. Antonio is hurt that Cesario is unmoved by all the kindness Antonio believes he has done for him. Cesario says he doesn't know him, but he does hate ingratitude in people. Antonio then says he saved this man from near death and that Sebastian, yes, he named him, is hard-hearted and not worth worshipping. He exits with the officers. Viola then speaks to the audience and says that she cannot believe what this man said. He named her brother, Sebastian. So perhaps he survived the storm. She then shares that she models her cross-dressing on the image of her brother. If her brother survived, it would be a miracle of nature. She exits. Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian are left on stage to comment that it was cowardly for Cesario to deny his friend help. They exit to see how things unfold. We're back in the streets of Illyria, and Sebastian has been mistaken for Cesario. Festi has been sent by Olivia to fetch Cesario and will not leave Sebastian alone. Festi doesn't believe Sebastian's claim that he is not Cesario. Sebastian pays Festi to leave him alone. Then, Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian who also mistakes Sebastian for Cesario, enter. Sir Andrew walks right up to Sebastian and strikes him. Sebastian strikes back and is restrained by Sir Toby as Festi leaves to fetch Olivia. Sir Toby and Sebastian draw swords to duel, just as Olivia enters and stops them. She tells Sebastian, who she also believes to be Cesario, to come with her, as she will make him feel better by sharing stories of other pranks of Toby's. Sebastian is bewildered, but he follows Olivia. Next, in a room in Olivia's house, Mariah is costuming Festi as a priest with a gown and a beard as part of their plot against Malvolio. Mariah leaves while Festi dresses and brings back Sir Toby. Festi puts on a fake voice and addresses Malvolio, who is offstage in the dark room, which is why this scene is often referred to as the dark room scene. Some modern productions use an onstage cell and have Malvolio blindfolded, so that the actor playing Mavolio can appear on stage. Festi pretends to be a priest named Sir Topis, visiting the sick and possessed Malvolio. Sir Toby and Mariah are pleased and say that, with Malvolio being unable to see and Festi being such a good actor, they really didn't need the disguise. Sir Toby then tells Festi to return to Malvolio as himself to check on how Malvolio is doing. Sir Toby says that he can't stay to watch and that they need to wrap this prank up soon, as he doesn't want Olivia to be any angrier with him. Sir Toby tells Festi to come find him later. Festi talks with Malvolio. Malvolio denies that he is mad, and Festi convinces him that Sir Topus is still in the room. Festi switches back and forth between playing Sir Topus and being himself. As Sir Topus, he forbids himself, Festi, from continuing to talk to the mad Malvolio. Festi pretends that Sir Topus leaves, and Malvolio begs Festi for pen, paper, and light so he can write a letter to Olivia. Festi agrees to bring it to him. Now we are back to Sebastian, who is bewildered by all that has happened to him. He can't believe his good fortune, like literally cannot believe it is real. He wishes for Antonio's guidance because he isn't sure if he is crazy or Olivia is. He logics that Olivia can't be crazy because she has incredible authority over her house. 
but he knows something fishy is up. Olivia then enters with a priest, a real one this time, not Festy in a costume. She asks Sebastian, who she thinks is Cesario, to go with her to the chapel and exchange pre-marriage vows before the priest, a sort of contract that would make them common-law spouses until they can have a public wedding. Because Olivia is a countess, she can't have a secret wedding, so she wants the insurance of the pre-wedding with Sebastian, who she believes is a now very nice to her Cesario. Sebastian agrees, and they go to exchange vows. Now we are in Act 5, and over the course of one long and hectic scene, all of the plots and almost all of the characters will be brought together in the street in front of Olivia's house. First up, Festy and Fabian are discussing the letter that Festy helped Malvolio to write. Fabian desperately wants to see the letter, and Festy refuses to let him see it. Orsino, Cesario, Curio, and other members of Orsino's court enter. Orsino asks if Fabian and Festi belong to Olivia, and Festi makes a joke that they are her appendages rather than dependents. Orsino admires Festi's wit and pays him, then asks Festi to go and fetch Olivia. Festi leaves as Antonio enters with officers. Cesario says that Antonio is the one who rescued him. This further adds to the confusion between the twins, as Cesario is referring to Antonio stopping the duel with Sir Andrew, but, as we know, Antonio also saved Sebastian from drowning. Orsino instantly recognizes Antonio as the captain of a tiny ship that engaged in incredibly destructive combat against the best ship in Orsino's navy. One of the officers confirms that Antonio is the pirate who captured one of Orsino's ships and boarded another. They say that they caught him in a skirmish in the streets. Cesario says that the skirmish was in defense of Cesario, though Antonio did say something very strange to Cesario as he was arrested. Orsino asks Antonio what he is doing in Illyria. Antonio claims he was never a thief or a pirate, but confesses that he has been Orsino's enemy. He says that witchcraft must have brought him here. He says he rescued Cesario, who he thinks is Sebastian, from drowning, and brought him to this town. He then defended Cesario, again mistaking him for Sebastian, but then Cesario claimed not to know him, which is true, Cesario does not know Antonio. Cesario is in disbelief and Orsino asks how long Antonio and Cesario came to town. Antonio says it has been three months, so apparently the first scene in this play happened three months ago. Then Olivia enters. Orsino sees her and quickly says that Antonio must be mistaken, as Cesario has been working for him for the past three months. Olivia begins to chide Cesario for not keeping an appointment with her. Remember, she believes Cesario to be Sebastian and vice versa, so Sebastian actually didn't keep the appointment. This leads to some more confusion, as Orsino is still trying to convince Olivia to marry him. Olivia is flippant with Orsino, which angers him. To get back at her, he vows to remove Cesario from her sight, because he knows that she is enamored with Cesario. Cesario happily follows and Olivia is confused and believes herself to have been deceived by Cesario. She tells an attendant to call forth for the priest that married her to Sebastian. Orsino commands Cesario to follow him. Olivia demands her husband stay with her. This is a surprise to Orsino and Cesario. The priest enters, and Olivia asks him to share what happened just hours ago between her and Cesario. The priest also believes Cesario and Sebastian are the same person, so he confirms that Cesario and Olivia exchanged pre-wedding vows. Orsino is enraged that his servant tricked him and instructs Cesario to stay out of his sight. Cesario tries to speak, but Sir Andrew enters, calling for a surgeon to be sent to Sir Toby as he believes Cesario has injured Sir Toby and himself. This beating takes place offstage at some point after Sebastian first encountered Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Olivia. Sir Andrew is surprised to see Cesario and once again says that Cesario is the person who injured both himself and Sir Toby. Cesario says that he never hurt Sir Andrew or Sir Toby, but that they drew swords upon him and he addressed them kindly. Sir Toby and Festi enter. Sir Toby is very drunk and has been for an hour. Olivia commands that Sir Toby be taken away, so Sir Andrew, Fabian, and Festi escort Sir Toby out. Now, Sebastian enters and runs directly to Olivia to apologize for hurting her Uncle Toby, and then realizes that she is looking at him funny. He again asks for forgiveness for hurting her uncle. Orsino comments that the person who has just entered is identical to Cesario in face, voice, and clothing. 
Sebastian, apparently oblivious, then sees Antonio and says that he has been so tortured since he parted ways with Antonio. Antonio questions if this person is indeed Sebastian and asks how Sebastian has made two of himself. Olivia is thrilled that there are two Cesarios. Sebastian finally sees Cesario and is confused, as he never had a brother and his sister died in that shipwreck. He asks Cesario how they are related. Cesario admits that he is from Messaline, and his father and brother were named Sebastian. Cesario's brother died in a wreck, so he assumes Sebastian must be the ghost of his brother. Sebastian says that he isn't a ghost, and that if Cesario was a woman, he would cry and welcome his drowned sister, Viola. Cesario says that his father had a mole upon his brow, and Sebastian says his did too. Cesario says that his father died on the day Viola turned 13. Sebastian confirms his father did too. Cesario reveals that he is Viola, and asks Sebastian not to celebrate their reunification until she appears as herself again. She shares that her feminine clothing is still with the captain who saved her from the wreck, and since then she has been serving Orsino as Cesario. Sebastian says that Olivia was mistaken to believe she was engaged to Cesario, but she is not deceived, as he is a noble and virginal man that Olivia is indeed betrothed to. Orsino tells Olivia not to be amazed, as Sebastian is noble by blood. Orsino turns to Viola and notes that she often told him, as Cesario, that she would never love woman like she loved Orsino. Viola confirms that she still feels this way. Orsino is interested in seeing Viola in her feminine clothing and asks for her hand. She obliges and repeats the information about her clothing being in the possession of the captain who saved her. Apparently, the captain has been imprisoned after being sued by Malvolio. Olivia says Malvolio will free the captain and calls to have Malvolio brought to her. Although, she notes, Malvolio has been behaving madly lately. Festi and Fabian re-enter, and Festi still has Malvolio's letter. He presents it to Olivia, who asks Festi to read it. Festi begins to read it in the character of a madman, and Olivia asks him what he thinks he is doing. Festi says he is reading madness, and if Olivia wants to hear the letter, it can only be read like that. Olivia tells Fabian to read it instead. The letter accuses Olivia of being behind the plot to have Malvolio imprisoned in the dark room. It also states that he is the letter she wrote, and he will use it to prove that she has wronged him. Olivia asks if Malvolio wrote this, and Festi confirms. Orsino says it doesn't actually sound that much like a madman. Olivia tells Fabian to bring Malvolio to her. She then addresses Orsino and asks him to think of her as a sister-in-law rather than a wife, thus encouraging Orsino to marry Viola, and says that all four can be wed at her house and at her cost on the same day. Orsino agrees to this idea. He turns to Viola and fires her from his service. Then he extends his hand and says that since she called him master for so long, from this moment she will be her master's mistress. Olivia is excited to call Viola her sister. Fabian returns with Malvolio, just in time to interrupt this happy moment. Malvolio gives Olivia the letter and describes everything that has been done to him. He demands to know why Olivia has done this to him. Olivia reveals that, although the handwriting on the original letter appears very similar to hers, it is actually Mariah's writing. Olivia pieces together that Mariah was also the first person to tell her that Malvolio was mad. She promises Malvolio that once they uncover who played this prank on him, he can decide their punishment. Fabian confesses that it was himself and Sir Toby who came up with the prank. Mariah wrote the letter at Sir Toby's request, and in return, he has married her. Fabian also clarifies that it was meant to be a harmless prank, and that when everything is explained, it will be obvious that it was just in good fun and more worthy of laughter than revenge. Festi admits to his part in the scheme, too. Malvolio exits, promising revenge. Orsino asks Fabian to follow Malvolio and get him to agree to drop this, as they still have to get Malvolio to drop his lawsuit against the captain who saved Viola. After that is done, Orsino says they will have that wedding. In the meantime, they will all stay at Olivia's house, and once Viola is back in her feminine clothing, she will be his mistress and ruler of his desire. But until then, he is going to keep calling her Cesario. All exit except for Festi, who ends the show with a song. And that is Twelfth Night. Woo! Join us next time with our Stuff to Chew on for Twelfth Night, where we talk about themes, motifs, and general topics of discussion with this play. Thanks for listening. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. 
This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare Any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Richard II, Act Two, Scene Two, said by York. Come, sister, cousin, I would say, pray pardon me.